Thanks for the music, Dominique. That was really nice. I make it to be one o'clock, so I think we should go ahead and begin. So I'd like to welcome you all to the sixth and final of the AMAS panel discussions. And the goal of today's discussion is really to wrap up and try to uh, see what we've learned from this AMAS program, which was started for the first time this year at SJSU. And we'd really like to know uh, how it worked and, and uh, what we all learned. So um, <clears throat> we have some wonderful panelists today, five uh, panelists who are all here, I believe. And I will introduce them briefly uh, in a moment. But um, before we do that, I just wanna remind you of what the other panels had as their themes so that we can uh, you know, refocus and remember some of the topics that, that we discussed earlier. So the first panel that we had uh, was <clears throat> about the topic of what is graduate school success. The second panel was about building a community of support. The third panel was about financial literacy and funding mechanisms. The fourth panel was about work-life balance. And the fifth panel was about mapping a career tra trajectory and cultivating a professional identity. So what we'd like to do today after, after we introduce the uh, panelists is I will ask each of, uh, I will ask the group um, a, a series of questions. And we're gonna do something slightly different this time than we've done in previous panels, which is that first we'll ask each of the panelists to respond to the, the question or the prompt. But then after that, before we go on to the next question, I will ask the graduate students who are here to comment or feedback or, or have any, uh, you know, questions about that particular topic. Um, because uh, one of the feedback we've gotten already is that the uh, people would like the panel discussions to be a little more interactive than they have been. And so this is a way of bringing in a little more conversation earlier in the program. Uh, and then after that, uh, we'll go to mentees questions and the graduate students here can uh, ask open-ended questions or whatever questions they have about anything. And um, you know, the goal would be really to summarize what we've learned from the, the AMAS program and uh, you know, some important takeaways that we don't wanna lose track of. So with that, I would like to begin by uh, asking the panelists to introduce themselves. And in your introductions, please uh, uh, tell us your name, your department, how long you've been at SJSU, uh, tell us a little bit about your undergraduate and graduate uh, educational uh, experience where you went to, to undergrad and grad and what field uh, or major. And, um, and then here's the, the tough question that uh, I hope some of you have been thinking about, which is um, what is the most challenging issue that you had to overcome as a graduate student? So with that, I will go down the list as it appears in my program. Uh, first off is uh, Professor Yu Chen. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Yu Chen and uh, I'm from um, School of Information System and Technology currently under um, College of Business. And um, <clears throat> about my background, I did my undergrad in information security in Huajiu University of Science and Technology in China. And then I moved on um, with a scholarship, went on to study my master's in security and mobile computing uh, in Aalto University in Finland and also Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Norway. Uh, that's about two years. And after that, I went out for my doctoral PhD studies in, in the field of human computer interaction uh, in, Swiss, in Swiss Institute of Technology, uh, Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne and the abbreviation is EPFL. And then I did a few years of postdoc um, with a support from uh, Swiss government in UC Irvine before I joined uh, San Jose State. Yeah, I joined here fall 2018 and this is my fourth year. So, so good to uh, get a chance to know everyone. All right, so that's a little bit about myself. Oh, okay, we have a next question. What is the most challenging issue I had to overcome as a graduate student? Um, I think in general, I am a first-generation, first-gen student 
So starting from my undergrad all the way until PhD and postdoc, et cetera, basically I had to navigate everything by myself. And uh, well, there's a lot of freedom and I enjoy it because my family wasn't able to supervise me on the professional level. So I had a lot of freedom to navigate, but the downside is there's a lot of things I don't know that I don't, I didn't know, I didn't know, and how to navigate those things. So a lot of how to or technical things I don't know, I didn't know how to do. Especially the major issue that has been bothering me, number one, after graduate school, how do I find a job? <laughs> That's a very practical question I've always facing. And uh, also, it took me quite a few years to figure out I really want to be a faculty. And then how do you get from where you were to uh, the destination that's your faculty job and how to navigate the whole um, job market and uh, et cetera. So I would say those are the most challenging issues I'm facing. Of course, there's a lot of other challenges, but this is the one that I feel um, very, I remember so well, and I'm hoping once you overcome that, I just feel you understand yourself and uh, the field much better. So I feel it's a very worthwhile um, challenge to, to work with in the past. All right, so that's a brief introduction about myself. Thank you. I'm so looking forward to this panel and get to know everyone. Thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, next on my list is Professor John Jang. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, my name is John Jen. I'm in the Department of Nutrition, Food Science, and Packaging. It's my fifth year, so I started in fall 2017. Um, I got my degree in nutritional sciences at UC Berkeley um, and then went to go on to get my PhD in nutritional sciences at Penn State University. Um, I, I see from the past panels that there's multiple Penn State alumni, so I recognize that from, from, from the others. Um, and then I came back to California, did my postdoc at Children's Hospital in Oakland. Um, so I grew up in the Bay Area. So this is where I grew up and where I came back to um, uh, in San Jose. So one of the things that was most challenging for me um, as a graduate student was when I, went to, when I went to grad school in Pennsylvania, I was basically on my own. I knew nobody out there. Um, so I had to be very independent when I was out there. I had to figure stuff out on my own. And I had a lot of, um, and I actually tried really hard to kind of figure things out on my own, but at some point it got to the point where it was overwhelming. I actually had so much stress trying to figure stuff out on my own that I actually almost had a panic attack. Um, I think my grandmother died around, you know, my, my third year of my PhD. I think I was in the middle of exams and also I was running experiments, trying to collect data at the same time. So it was, I had all these things I was trying to balance and I, literally was in my advisor's office, like almost like breaking down and having a panic attack. First time in my life was a little bit scary. Um, but I think what came out of that was my advisor was wise. And he said that, you know, grad school is just a part of your life and you got to prioritize the things that are most important for you. So I had to kind of think about what, what that was for me. Um, but not, not only that, not only that, but I also had to reach out for help. And what the thing that was difficult was for me to seek help from others, right? So that was the thing that I had to overcome the most is to be able to rely on others for support. And that was really hard for me um, as a graduate student. So that's kind of the nutshell of, of that difficult uh, part of my life. But if I'm, I'll be happy to talk about it more if anybody has any questions. Thank you, John. Uh, next up is Professor Johnny Ramirez. Good afternoon, everyone. Can, can folks hear me? Are we good on the audio? Okay, nice, yeah. Uh, happy Friday, or, uh, or I would say happy Friday, <laughs> depending on how your week's been treating you. Uh, so again, my name is uh, Johnny Carlos Ramirez. Um, I am a first year student, a new hire to the Department of Chicano Chicano Studies here at San Jose. So yeah, I got a job. I got the tenure track job, right? Uh, was definitely a goal and dream of mine uh, to be able to be a Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx studies uh, professor. Um, I would say that my journey was a little bit a, um, of a non-traditional student, I think at some point, in the sense that uh, I struggled a lot in my K through 12 education. And at some point was uh, what uh, scholars would call school push out. 
um, and kind of had to really early on figure out like, what was my education uh, gonna mean to me? How was my education in this path gonna be a part of my identity? And it was early on getting exposed to um, some student activists and college students in the mid nineties um, that were doing work around the field of Chicano and Chicana studies. I grew up in uh, Southern California in the Inland Valley, San Gabriel Valley area. Um, and um, yeah, I think that was a big turning point, me getting involved with these students and getting mentored and getting plugged in. So um, I started my college education at uh, Chafee College out in Rancho Cucamonga as a transfer student. I did three years there, took my first Chicano studies class and got on fire. I think initially I was going to go math. I had this amazing math professor. He was a Berkeley graduate, uh, Dr. Tom. I still remember calling, you know, uh, honor our ancestors, Dr. Tom. And he was a... Um, he had an independent radio show. He, he would do sports casting and he did it as a student at Berkeley. He would cover the football games. So I remember kind of like, you know, experiencing mentorship kind of early on and seeing what that felt like. But then I got to this class that was really helping me and giving me the lenses to articulate my family's experiences and my community condition and who I, and who I was. And I think that really, I carried those things with me. I think that's what really has kept me connected uh, to stay my path in the educational pipeline. So I was there in community college, uh, transferred to UCLA, uh, majored in history and Chicano studies as well, uh, continued my student activism and leadership and got engaged um, early on working around social justice issues, uh, wrapped up my undergrad and then took some time off for about uh, uh, seven to eight years. I worked as a, a labor organizer uh, with a, a union now that's called Unite Here that works with hotel and industrial workers and got a chance to travel across the US. And I think for me, it was that time to kind of grow to kind of mature, I think in college life, you know, there's a way to kind of have your lifestyle going where you can work hard, but you can also play hard and hang out a lot. And I think, you know, my shift in uh, doing full-time organizing and traveling around, I think was that kind of that mirror of reflection. You have these um, opportunities and these resources and skills, how can you really come into community and start to build? So um, after kind of being on the road and doing that, I came back to California with family and I applied for a master's program um, at Cal State Northridge. So I did my master's in Chicano and Chicana studies. And at that point, um, I was also working with the youth organization. And I thought I, my, my next step was gonna be to become the next executive director. So I thought with my master's degree and the mentors there in the community, they were like, this would be good. You're gonna get introduced to research. You're gonna have these writing skills. You could come back uh, to the organization called the Pico Center and you'll be able to help write grants and take on the leadership role, like help us increase capacity. So I felt like that was my calling. But when I got into the program, I, I have you know, met some amazing femtors that pulled me inside and said, you know, Johnny, the work that you, you and your group are doing, are, 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 it's changing the models and the paradigms of how we see youth of color. You know, the traditional research looks at youth of color from a very much deficit perspective, looks at them as delinquents, look at them as troubled, and you're talking about look, uh, uh, exa uh, building with young folks and recognizing all the capitals and all the knowledge and experiential experiences they have and center it um, as, as power. So, um, so I was like, all right, let's go. Not really knowing what the journey was gonna take me. So I applied to the Sally Casanova program and I, and I got it at, my Cal, uh, at, uh, at uh, Northridge. And then that um, ended up kind of giving me the resources and the mentorship to apply to my doctoral program at UCLA. So I did a PhD in education with a specialization of race and ethnic studies. And my work looks at community-based youth programs that use a social justice lens to empower our young folks to develop a critique of social oppression and a motivation for social justice. And it's this kind of framework that we work in, in critical race theory and education called transformational resistance. So for me, kind of coming into my doc program and kind of on this path, I had already kind of been grounded in community and kind of knew um, you know, how I wanted to kind of walk into academia and, and do this work um, uh, in the sense of I knew that I wanted to develop what we call an activist scholar identity. So I knew that I wanted, I didn't want those being an activist and scholar to be in contention with one another. I've been mentored by other activist scholars in the Chicano Studies program and in community that were able to model that for me. So for that, I would be forever thankful. So I knew it was possible. But I think that leads me into the last question of like, what was the most challenging issue for me? I think the most challenging issue for me, especially in my doc program, was honoring those commitments of being an activist scholar, uh, in, engaging in 
um, youth participatory action research methodology. So I would come in and for about eight years, I worked with the youth program. So I was a part of the programming and the development of youth that were in my study. At the, at the, at the same time, I'm also taking my classes and kind of doing my work in academia. And I think the challenging part was, was recognizing that to be able to sustain myself, I had to do a lot of work at the time. So I worked in the McNair's program, I worked in mentoring programs and the Center for Community College Partnership, and I was working out there in the field. So it was at some point uh, balancing three jobs. And then in my third and fourth year, I was a TA with like 60 students a class doing those things to try to cover tuition and all those things. So to say the least, I think the challenge was being first gen, you know, similar to what folks have shared, being first gen everything, I didn't know how to like really balance these things out. And I think the challenging part was trying to develop those fellowship applications and trying to publish and put out my work at the midst of carrying all that. Um, so um, when I finally at the end, my last year in my program, I got the dissertation year fellowship where I actually had one year covered. And when that happened, I just, I wrote my whole dissertation and got done in one year when I finally got the resources. So uh, we can talk about it a little bit more, but if I had to go back, I would say, um, and it's part of one of the themes here about that uh, financial literacy and funding mechanisms. I think if you're really considering about choosing that next step in your journey, especially a doc program, you really need to consider the funding package and what that's gonna look like for you. Because I really think, you know, when we think about the traditional ways that academia and the university works, you know, they, they really say, we don't want our students to work, right? That's kind of like the overall banner. We don't want our students, we just want them to focus on study. And I think kind of like when you're first gen coming in, in particular, you're trying to cover your resources and make sure that that happens. And, and I think uh, that that's something that's very critical. It's gonna impact how much work that you're able to get out and then also your overall wellness. So um, I'll stop there, but thank you y'all and uh, just honored and thankful to be here. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, you covered a lot of ground there. <laughs> uh, I'm actually gonna pick up on something you said. Uh, for those of you uh, who are interested in pursuing a, a PhD uh, program at some point, we still have the Sally Casanova and also the Chancellor, Chancellor's Doctoral Incentive Programs, which are supported by the CSU system. And they're, they're very well worth looking into because not only do they provide financial support, but they provide mentoring support. So, uh, you know, uh, Professor Ramirez mentioned the Sally Casanova as being uh, one of the steps that he took when he was in his master's program. And so I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware that those are all still active programs and we can help you with that if you're interested. But moving on, uh, next on my list, I have Professor Nathan Lupton. Hi, everyone. It's going to be hard to follow up on Johnny's uh, great <laughs> speech there. That was a lot of information. Thanks. Very interesting stuff. Um, so uh, I um, have been at SJSU now only a short time since the fall of 2020. So this is my second year that I'm just getting towards the end of now four more weeks of classes, but he's counting. Um, and uh, I, uh, before that, I was five years in a small university in Alberta, in Canada. Um, so five years there. Um, and then prior to that, <laughs> I moved around a lot. <clears throat> Four years in uh, Fordham University in New York City, uh, which is the first academic uh, post that I took after my uh, finishing my PhD in 2011. So that's sort of my history of my my. Uh, work in academia. Before that, I used to work in telecommunications, so um, I'm a bit uh, late getting into this game compared to some people, I guess you could say. I did my undergraduate degree at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario. I'm a Canadian, A. Eh? Um, I also did uh, my Master's of Business Administration at Carleton University, but I did something unusual. It was a thesis-based Masters of Business Administration, something that you're not going to find too many places. Um, but at that point, I actually really knew I wanted to go into academia, and I really wanted that to be the path I took. Um, I found in my previous careers that I would always used to get bored with things, and I school was the one thing I loved the most. Um, and I just kept going back to it. So, um, so I did that, and then I went directly into my PhD um, at the Ivy School of Business, which is... Uh, part of the University of Western Ontario, or at least that's what it says on my diploma nowadays. They've changed the name of the University of Western University for some reason. Try telling that to people in California that you know London, Ontario is the West. <laughs> but 
Um, that's where I did my PhD in business administration. Like I said, I went on to my academic career from there and I've been there ever since. Most challenging issue that I overcome as a graduate student, honestly, I found this uh, extremely challenging. Uh, <laughs> the whole thing. I could probably spend less time talking about what I didn't find challenging, uh, but I would have to say that suddenly when I was doing my PhD, I found myself unexpectedly in um, the most isolated period of my life, and that was the tough one for me. I could not have anticipated um, suddenly being completely blocked off from everyone. I mean, I used to I'm used to at least having other uh, students in the class as being, you know, part of my cohort. And, but, you know, they all had their families and they uh, didn't really hang around the campus very much. And so we didn't see each other very much. Um, and so that one is actually, it took me like all five years of just struggling through to really find communities where I could get um, support. And what I finally found out eventually was um, the way it has to work for me is I have to give in order to, to get that, that kind of community support. And so I really got into volunteering a lot. Uh, in particular, I was working with this group from Burma called the Karen, that's the ethnicity that they, um, they go by. Um, there's many ethnic groups in Burma, of course, and uh, just through them. I mean, they did so much for me in terms of teaching me about community and about um, resilience. Oh my God, what resilience those people had considering all they'd been through. And uh, yeah, so that's, I guess I could say, you know, I didn't want to leave this as sort of a negative sort of, uh, it was it was pure hell, but I learned so much in this process. Like it really was a growth period for me in my life that I was sort of forced into unexpectedly. Thanks, Nathan. Um, last but not least on our panel this, uh, this afternoon, felt like morning still to me, <laughs> uh, is uh, Professor Carlos Rojas. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, it still kind of feels like morning here. Um, it's morning somewhere, I guess. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, again, I'm Carlos Rojas. I'm in the computer engineering department. This is my third year here at San Jose State. Um, before this, uh, my background's pretty simple. Uh, I went to UC Davis to get my bachelor's in computer science and stayed there all the way till my postdoc, actually. So I've um, been in California all my life, essentially. Um, and um, let's see, uh, what's the most challenging issue that I had to overcome in graduate school? For me, it, it was mainly, as uh, some of the panelists have uh, also um, reminded me, is uh, so I was a first generation uh, college student. And so talking to my family about anything I did in school was, uh, you know, they couldn't help me. Um, and so mostly for me, the challenge was is especially in graduate school, was getting to figure out how to do research, what it meant to actually do research. I had no idea what you did as a researcher, especially in computer science. Um, and all I knew is that I was interested in understanding something to do with graphics and maybe trying to use that in a way to um, make some advances in biology of some sort. Um, and so, yeah, many of my challenges were just navigating research life and trying to figure out what that meant afterwards. Um, I think I, I I always had an like, idea that I wanted to be a faculty, but I didn't even know what that entailed. Um, so trying to figure that out as you're going through graduate school um, was a pretty long process. Um, and then towards the end, one of the issues, you know, you're in school for a very long time when you're in graduate school for a PhD. So, life is going to happen. So, you know, a lot of life events happen that kind of can derail your graduation rates and publications and whatnot. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll, I guess I'll keep it short. And if there's any follow up questions, uh, I can answer those. Wonderful. Thank you, Carlos. What a great panel we've got today. Thank you all for being here. Um, so again, the, the topic for today is really wrap up and final thoughts. And so I thought maybe the first question that we should ask our panelists is what is an important thing that came up in one of our panel discussions that you'd like to make sure that we reiterate? Something that we don't wanna lose, something that came up, maybe it was just a comment, maybe it was in the chat, or maybe it was a major theme, but something that really is important that we, we don't wanna lose the thread on. Uh, and you know, anyone who wants can go ahead and start. Uh, any takers? Johnny? Sure, thank you, Mark. 
Yeah, and uh, and I'll I'll try to be concise. I think I'm all uh, hyped up and excited to be on the panel. But uh, but one of the things that I think, and I and I and I know that uh, Nathan kind of I think really uh, touched on it too in part of his introduction, was the importance of building a community of support. And I remember sitting in on that on that uh, um, panel or workshop, and kind of thinking about in my development and journey. And as now as I mentor a lot of first gen or students that have intersectional identities, par parenting students. You know, students that, you know, again, being the first time to academia per se and being in these university spaces. And what does it mean to be able to find that connection and support when a lot of times being in those spaces at times there could be a heaviness, it could be very triggering. It can like, you know, kind of make it a bit difficult to feel uh, uh, or to see your role in that space. And um, one of the things that I, that I thought that I would share would be uh, some of my mentors work. So. Um, in the field of education, Dr. Uh, Daniel Solorsono, he talks about how when students come into academia in particular, into graduate school, how um, sometimes, yes, there's these academic spaces that can feel hostile at times and don't feel so inclusive at times. And what, what he had found in through uh, researching what students have experienced, um, a bit of like uh, racism, sexism, th those type of kind of uh, logics and, 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 and forms of oppression, that the power came when these students and faculty and community got together and created these things called counter spaces. So what, what these counter spaces are, are these spaces where you'll be able to come in and kind of connect with community. And those counter spaces sometimes can happen at, in academia. I remember at UCLA, we had a lot of students across departments that would come to our Friday research course and see that course as a counter space. A lot of just other students wanted to see other students from similar backgrounds and experiences and connect with them. I know a lot of uh, students that I've mentored in the past uh, coming from a postdoc at the University of Denver, a lot of, of the graduate students there were finding community or uh, finding that support in community. They were part of like uh, yoga circles. Some of them were like doing the high pitch softball team. Um, so, so I guess I would just echo that coming in when you think about, okay, my next step or how do I wanna go in potentially into academia? I think to find that counter space might not be very, um, like kind of uh, uh, forefronting, you might have to go on a journey to figure out where that might be. So I, I think that's something that I that I, I think I carried in and would say that um, yes, it's overall. And and then sometimes you might find that counter space even within your department, which would be awesome. But just to know that that to be intentional about that, I think would be would be huge. And then um, the second point would be more on the financial literacy and on the finding funding mechanism would be this, that um, I think at some point, I think um, in, in my journey and, and similar journeys that I've, I've been through mentorship and I've seen other graduate students kind of go through as well, is kind of knowing that of course, you know, my uh, doctoral graduate education is close to investing in my first house. And I, and I would never, you know, there's no money that could take away the education and the development and, and being able that I'm, I'm now at the, the job that I had envisioned way back for myself. But I would say that I, I think if I had to go back, I would know when to turn on the loans and to turn off the loans. And I think getting closer to when you're like, you're thinking about your, your journey, your development, especially when you get to the dissertation process and the dissertating piece, that might be the time where you're gonna need the most resources. So I would just say to please think, to consider that. Like, of course, you know, cause right now in a lot of the discussions I have with students is once they start to kind of even hear student loans, it just triggers and no, I don't wanna get loans and everything. And I, and I think it's just kind of maybe reevaluating that and saying, yes, of course you don't wanna get into debt, but at times you might have to use that as strategic tool to get done. And I think, and at the end, um, at some point, you know, especially folks that come from working class backgrounds, you know, being first gen, those type of things, we have to invest in our education. We have to support ourselves to be able to get through. And if that loan is there, um, it, it might be a viable resource to do so. I'll, I'll stop there, but those two things I thought was really huge in the discussions that we've had over the year. Thanks, Johnny, both really important points. Um, any other panelists wanna chime in on a, a takeaway they wanna- I could, uh, yeah, maybe, so uh, just to reiterate again, Johnny said it and I said it in my introduction, I kind of gave away, um, you know, that sense that building community for me was the most important aspect of it because it was the biggest challenge. Um, I was very lucky to have some, um, financial support, which I, because I'd applied for a, uh, a grant before I started, that was the, uh, the one smart thing I've done, <laughs> um, which almost happened by luck, I guess, but 
Uh, you know, even there, you know, we're struggling with money. That's always going to be the case. And that's all right, because, uh, you know, we have to go through that at some point. Um, I was just looking through the list again. And so another one that comes up is success and really understanding and knowing why you're doing what you're doing um, and why it's important to you, because there will be a lot of forces that pull you in different directions. Um, you may even have advisors who sort of look at what you're interested in and think, well, I don't really see the value in that or something like that. And I've had some experiences like that as a graduate student. Um, and you know what? Sometimes your advisors are wrong, <laughs> that there is uh, really something there and that, you know, you should follow it because you, you want to, right? I mean, um, I would say that. So when it comes to success, I'm actually teaching a course right now for freshmen. This is my first time teaching freshmen. And uh, we talk about something called head, heart, and hands. Um, head being what we think, heart what we feel, and our hands are what we do. And when we can try and bring those things into alignment with each other, that's success. And that's what I try and uh, impress upon them, not tell them, but try and impress upon them that if your heart's telling you something, um, even though your mind's telling you something else, there's a conflict there and you need to sort of step back and think about that and wonder where's that conflict coming from. Um, and then, you know, likewise, you want to look at what you're doing with your time and, you know, is what you're doing with your time, is it actually in support of what you think you should be doing and what you feel you should be doing? And again, not easy, right? But to pull those three parts together, I think that's where, for me personally, if I can do that, that's where I experience success. Great, thank you, Nathan. Other panelists want to chime in? I can uh, add a little bit uh, upon what Johnny has shared about. And I really um, think it's important to build a community of support or a network of support, however you mentioned that. And I think I want to stress that because that's something I was not doing well and I was not realizing that almost the last year of my PhD, because I was pretty isolated and just stay in my lab almost um, nine, 10 hours per day and seven days per week. I was just thinking the harder I work and more productive I would be really isolated. And uh, right now, but that things change starting uh, once during my last year, I feel really desperate about what do, what do I do with my my future and uh, I got to met a career coach and which was also sponsored by the university at that point. We'll talk a little bit about that very soon. But this is always this is what I always share with my students undergrad and graduate level is try to create your network of mentors. And by that um, and uh, communities, however, you, um, the different ways you can mention that. And uh, if you're really thinking about why we need the community or the mentor network, it's really because we have all diverse aspects of needs. Some of them may be intellectual, some of them may be professional. For example, how do you apply for the job? Uh, intellectual, a lot of times it might be your a professional, oh, sorry, intellectual, that might be your uh, supervisor and uh, other, um, maybe your thesis committee, et cetera. And then maybe you will need a lot of support, emotional support. And just now John mentioned when he was in his graduate school, there's a time of he felt overwhelming. And then, um, then the then your grandma was um, in the hospital and also had having this panic attack. And I believe at this point, nobody, oh, it's very difficult for one to face that by just by yourself and it will be really important to have some emotional support. And sometimes it might be conflict and you can not easily tell anyone, maybe you need a safe space. And, and also you may need peers. And for me, I, was, I think I was really lucky during my master and PhD thesis, there's always someone who accidentally are starting and finishing almost the same time with me. So let's do the daily check-in to write our thesis together. And I think that's really helpful. Otherwise, I don't think I've finished maybe two years or three years to write my dissertation. So this is a peer support. So basically I mentioned all this just to um, make sure that our students know you have all kinds of needs. And what I mentioned, just a little bit of that. 
by identifying all your needs, then you know for each need you may be able to find different kind of support. And then you, you might be feel empowered that you can be supported in all aspects, maybe not just your studies and your professional life, but also your daily life. We're seeing you as a whole person life, lifelong. So creating this network of support is really important. And just very briefly, I think that the time I realized that was, I mentioned I was super isolated all the time until not last year, last semester of my PhD, where I just don't know what I didn't know what I do after that. Uh, get my paper rejected and didn't have a decent publication, et cetera. And then there's, there was a university sponsored program very similar with this uh, Amos program. And then we each, uh, each group has a small group coach. And then I just, didn't know what I need until the coach helped me to identify everything. And then I think, oh, actually I was not that bad. I was thinking worthless, whatever kind of <laughs> words you can identify myself. And uh, that was back in 2013. And the coach has helped me in my PhD, my postdoc until now, we are in, in touch all the time, just cannot, express how much I feel grateful for all kinds of support. So, and again, uh, I, my mentor always told me, if you want to walk fast, then walk along. If you want to uh, walk far, then walk together. And together, that can be different kinds of uh, communities that can, or people that can provide you with support. Really encourage everyone, think about yourself, I understand gradually gain clarity about your needs and actually find support towards that. Yeah, so that's just a little bit to add upon uh, what Johnny has already beautifully uh, laid out. Thank you, you. <clears throat> I have to add to that because I bring maybe a slightly different generational perspective to this. I won't tell you how old I am, but let me just put it this way. When I started graduate school, Jimmy Carter was the president of the United States. <clears throat> so we'll just leave it at that. But I wanted to mention that this community of support that you have, uh, several of you have talked about can stay with you for your entire career. And so you meet these people in graduate school and maybe they're the people who you're you know, sharing some uh, you know, data analysis with uh, as you prepare your dissertation, or maybe they're people in a class that you had, or maybe they're you know, a, a faculty mentor or something like that. And what happens is over the course of a long career like mine, uh, over time, these people, continue in the, in the field and they tend to get into higher and higher positions. So now those people who were essentially kids when I knew them are CEOs of companies or you know, endowed professors at Harvard or stuff like that. And so I can call these people up when I have an issue and I can say, hey, I really need to know how do I navigate this situation? And these people have enormous uh, you know, experience as well as quite a lot of uh, sway because of the positions that they've attained in their in their respective places. So this community of support, it, of course, it helps you get through grad school and get onto the first career step. But I just don't, I wanna make sure that uh, you realize that for someone like me, who's been around for a long time, those folks have helped me throughout my entire career. It doesn't end when you leave grad school. So I just wanted to kind of, I know, so the community of support obviously is very important based on everybody's um, discussion so far, but I wanted to kind of, Bring a different angle to this. So a question might be like, yes, we need a community to support. It's going to be valuable during your grad school and beyond. So I think we all realize that from everybody's examples. So a question that I have, or somebody, some of you might have, is like, how do I actually start building this community to support itself? I think, and um, you know, so for me, I was very, as I said in my introduction, I was very like independent trying to figure things out on my own I wasn't seeking out these this community I did have this panic attack and had issues from that perspective um, so I didn't really start building that community until after that point but what the turning point was really um, you know seeking support from one person was the beginning right so just making sure that you it's always hard to get started and I think that's the barrier that maybe a lot of students are uh, having to build that community to support is how do I get started? Um, I'm a very introverted person. I don't like talking to people when I was a student. So I was like, you know, I want to do my own thing. Uh, but just realizing that once I did ask a peer for some help or my mentor for some help, 
I realized it's such it's so much more efficient actually to get support from others rather than trying to figure stuff out on my own. I don't want to have to build the wheel from scratch. I can just borrow the wheel from somebody else. So I think what got me kind of rolling in, um, in building that community of support is just start. Just ask somebody for some support. It doesn't have to be something profound or something big. It just has to be something. So then you at least experience what that benefit is. So I think that's kind of where you have to begin. Um, and then all the examples that have been brought up since uh, once you start building it, it's going to be very valuable and very uh, important. Um, but I do also want to add a, a, uh, another thing that I think um, that was mentioned in um, some of the early panels and um, something that stood out to me and something that I think about a lot is the idea of, about imposter syndrome. And I think it, it's always there and it's, and it's always existing regardless of where you're at. So as a grad student, you always think that everybody's smarter than you. They're, they're gonna be, they're doing so in, interesting projects and research, like, like what am I doing? And even, even now as a professor, I still feel the same way. And I'm sure, you know, 20 years from now, I'll still feel the same way. So I think, I feel like having the feeling of being an imposter is actually normal and is actually healthy. So I think if you feel that way, it, it's, it's actually part of the process and it helps to drive you to do more. I think that's actually the value of, in, the, of imposter syndrome. So I think that's something that was uh, brought up in one of the earlier panels that really stuck out to me. So I will, I will pause there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Any other uh, comments from the panel? If not, then why don't I go ahead and turn it over to the grad students, uh, if any of the mentees want to either react to anything that the panel just said about the question of an important takeaway from the earlier panels, or if they want to add something, now would be a great time. Any takers? Yeah, well, we can warm up and get to it a little bit later then. Last chance for uh, before I move on to the next question. All right, let's go ahead and move on. <clears throat> um, the second question I'd like to ask the panel to consider is um, what is something that came out of one of your small group discussions? Something that maybe the entire group didn't hear, but that came up when you were talking with your small group of mentees uh, that uh, you'd really like to share with the larger group. I could start on that one if you like. Um, one of the things I remember we talked about several times um, is something that every single graduate student, myself included, uh, and every human being uh, experiences as part of having to do a lot of work. And that's um, unfortunately the procrastination. Um, it's, it's just purely natural as human beings that we um, sometimes put things off because it's for whatever reason there's I know a whole psychology and biology even behind it um, but uh, one of the things that we talked about a little bit was you know that relationship with the advisor and uh, one of the things that I think for me personally um, I had to realize it wasn't easy to realize was that I really have to appreciate when someone pushes me a bit because without that um, you know, it's um, sometimes we don't get over that, right? And so you, you want to make sure that with your relationship with your advisor that you're talking to them <clears throat> relatively often for, you know, I mean, it may be different depending, I don't know what the situation is in different um, disciplines, but um, certainly if they're not pushing to get things done, that's not necessarily a good thing because <clears throat> you do want to um, keep progressing, so. That's all. I mean, and like I said, I think, the, you know, it's it's something we all do. It's like, you know, you want to we feel ashamed about it, of course. Um, but, you know, it's it's such just a normal, common part of the human experience that we have to acknowledge it and then, you know, use our um, whatever strategies we can to help get over that. And, uh, you know, having others there to push you is one uh, if you, you know, Certainly without that, I don't think I would be able to uh, ever get out of it myself personally. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. <clears throat> Absolutely. Any other panelists want to chime in? Sure, I'll, I'll chime in. Oh, 
I'll go quickly and Carlos, you can come, come in after. So not a, not a specific topic, but it's something that I observed during um, the small group meetings is that um, something that, you know, inherently I kind of know and think about, but maybe it was, it was good to kind of be reminded of that, you know, everybody has their own story and their own perspective of things that are happening. And that um, I always have to get, you know, it's good to get reminded that, you know, you don't know everything that's behind the surface of a person so that, you know, you need to allow people to share whatever's comfortable with them and that whatever uh, type of vibe that they're giving off or um, maybe somebody feels is quieter or more talkative, it's probably for some reason uh, underlying the surface. So just for me, just being reminded that's that was the case during um, the small group meetings was valuable. It's like, oh, it's, it's something, you know, it was good to have those reali that realization um, as I was talking to different um, people within our small groups. So more just an observation rather than a specific topic. So I thought that was uh, for me, um, something that it's a good reminder for everybody to, to, you know, ask questions and to listen carefully when you're talking to other people. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. That's an important point. And I would say, even if people aren't willing to share, there may be things under the surface that you don't know. And so you always, I think it's always good to lead with kindness because there might be things going on that you just have no idea about. So absolutely. Uh, anyone else want to chime in? Um, yeah, I guess just to follow up with what um, John uh, just mentioned, I, I think uh, one of my takeaways that I, I took away was, yeah, you know, a, a lot of us maybe had similar backgrounds, but still our challenges could be different and then our paths are kind of vary. Um, but still, you can still find some, you know, commonalities, for example, uh, as uh, you just mentioned, uh, imposter syndrome was a big one that we discussed and how, yeah, it doesn't really go away. You just kind of learn strategies to ignore it, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it's just a good reminder that um, everyone's slightly different and everyone's going to take a different path, but it's good to hear other perspectives. Yeah. Thank you, Carlos. Anyone else want to chime in on this question? <clears throat> Anything else come out of the small group discussions that you'd like to share with the larger group? Um, yeah, I can try. So uh, maybe a little bit continuation about the um, uh, community, et cetera. Uh, we had a session in our group discussing uh, just this is a small exercise for our group members to lay out different aspects that you might need support. And then under that aspect, uh, encourage them to list three names under that. And just, and again, the rule of thumb is try your best. I'm not saying everyone has three mentors under every aspect, et cetera, just try that. So they had about 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes <laughs> uh, to draw that all aspects of their needs that might need support. Um, and uh, also try to put three names under that. So um, after that, we shared uh, within the group and there are different kinds of reactions. Uh, the first type is, oh, I cannot think about a single name for one of the needs, but I can list a lot of the names, for example, emotional support. I can list a lot of names for there. And some of the, and for that, the, the, our group member realized, okay, I noticed actually I am more resourceful than what I thought. And I already have this uh, list of mentors that can support me. And now I only have this area that in the future, I will be more aware and conscious and intentional in creating my mentorship network. And some of the members, they mentioned, oh, I noticed one of my family members, we tend to ask him a lot of questions, but never thought about, oh, intentionally having him or her guiding me. And then there are also, um, yeah, so those kind of, I just feel like um, continuing our discussion before, it is always a way of identifying what are your what are some of the issues that you need support and then actively um, just feel oh this is the blank I need to potentially make myself more empowered and then just make that next step as some of our panelists just mentioned to empower myself so 
this is the moment where I think our members just gain more understanding about their own support systems that I wanna share. Thank you so much. That's, <clears throat> that's such a great point. Um, I feel like sometimes um, if there are areas where you need support and you can't name them, that that sort of leads to despair, right? You, you don't know what to do, but if you can start to identify what are the actual issues and then you can start to build the support networks that you need to help with those issues, that's a great strategy. Anyone else want to add to this uh, to this question about uh, small group items that uh, you want to share with the larger group? Just one quick thing, um, more philosophical than anything else again, but something that I, I learned is that um, I learned a lot through the small groups <laughs> interactions, and I just want everybody to realize that everybody's always learning, so even the mentors within this program. So I, I felt like I learned a lot from talking to the small group members as well. So um, don't so everybody can contribute in their in their own way based on their own experiences. So um, and learning is lifelong, as the cliche always is said. Great, thank you. Any other panelists want to chime in? Shall we turn it over to the students and see if they have any uh, issues? Did, did, did you folks uh, have any observations from your small group sessions uh, that you would like to share with the larger panel? I could do the trick of just being silent for a long time until someone talks, but I don't want to pressure people. So why don't we go ahead and, and move on? And uh, if anybody has anything, we can bring it back in the, in the, in the uh, mentees question section, which is coming up shortly. Uh, let's move on to the third of the questions that I wanted to ask the panelists. Uh, <clears throat> and that is, you know, we've, we've talked about the five panels that we uh, had already in the AMAS program. We tried as, as organizers to come up with topics for those panels that we think really encompass the important things that would help graduate students moving through their process, but we surely missed some things. So the question is, is there something about graduate school success that you would like to bring up that doesn't fit or didn't fit nicely into one of the panel topics? Uh, if, if I may start, I, I think, um, and I guess I don't know if I'd want to frame that maybe these ideas, I, I want to acknowledge that maybe they were kind of touched on, I think at some point, at least the ideas that I was kind of developing, because I, I really think about the small group interactions of, of my, my uh, mass, uh, mentees and like kind of how all that went too. And um, I remember having some conversations um, that I thought would be important, like for the wrap up would be this idea of like kind of protecting your energy. And I'm still kind of walking through that but I remember like you know being first gen and stuff and kind of knowing that you know you're, you're, you're connected to family you're still connected to to friends and you know relationships dating like all those type of things and I think early on or when it got really towards the end again with the dissertating and trying to stay focused that um, I really needed to reflect on what protecting your energy would look like so I, I would hope that like in the future we're talking about maybe some wellness strategies where you're able to kind of Let's begin to identify what your personal and home space could look like, right? Whatever those spaces look like. And I would think that those spaces would look like restoration where you could just kind of put everything down and like recharge your batteries and recenter yourself so that the next day or the next moment you could go. And then peace, the importance of peace, right? That like a lot of times as thinkers and as intellectuals, right? Or as practitioners, that there's a lot on our minds sometimes, especially when, when some of us have these commitments for social justice, right? Or commitments for decolonization, right? Like in many ways, we're challenging these systems, structures and institutions to move in a different way. And you're kind of, you know, going against the grain. So, so I think sometimes those spaces for peace would be key. And then again, I think it's what we've echoed is, is, is to find support, right? Because academia does a good job of siloing you. Academia sometimes does a good job of alienated you. These ideas and logics of competition, meritocracy, when, when I think at the end, you know, maybe we can think about some workshop strategies on how do we develop like these like study groups or what, what I would call maybe like academic work collectives where we come together in community and share the readings, engage one another, like do the stuff outside of the classroom where, where indirectly it's, it, it, it allows us to a, a, a address the workload 
but at the same time, do it in a way that's more healthy and more collective. And, and I know that, you know, it takes unique folks with a certain level of awareness and desire to do it. But again, you know, maybe these are even recommendations that we can continue to build on so that the university starts to take note and starts to see of, of, of developing some of these strategies. So those would be the two is like to protect your energy and then to, to try to work collectively as much as you can. And again, it, it, I think like John said it beautifully, it starts with one person. <laughs> and I think if you just find that one person and find an advisor that believes in you as a scholar, but then also sees you as a person. If you can find those connection of the two, I think you'd be in a good place. Yeah, thank you, Johnny. That's great. I love this idea of sort of preserving energy and, and <clears throat> especially about the, getting to the question of how do you uh, how do you make those connections? Uh, Carlos mentioned earlier, I think in the chat, uh, I think I saw it go by, that um, a study group is a really good first step because it just puts a and it could be just two people. And you know, I'll, I'll tell a story about my own graduate experience. So <clears throat> in my first year of graduate school, we had these things called cumulative exams where we had to get together once a month and take you know a, a, a very difficult exam. And we had to pass so many out of so many in order to continue in the program. And a couple of us were kind of struggling. We weren't, we weren't doing as well as we wanted to be doing. And we realized that we needed to get together and uh, just start to think about how we're gonna prepare for these. And so it was one other guy and me who got together and we started writing questions for each other. We'd go into an, old, into an empty classroom in the middle of the night. You know, I'd go on one side of the board, this was Blackboard in those days, and uh, write down <clears throat> uh, you know, some very difficult question, the hardest thing I could think of that I knew the answer to. This other guy would do the same thing on the other side of the board. Then I'd, we'd switch and I'd try to answer his question. He tried to answer mine. And we would do this for a while. And two things happened. The first is we started doing better on our exams <clears throat> because we were much better prepared. We were thinking outside the box. Actually writing the questions was almost more help, valuable than trying to solve the questions because it forced us to organize the material in new ways. But the second thing that happened was I kind of became friends with this guy. And what we did is, you know, I, I'm a chemist by training. So I was in it, working in the laboratory, trying to do chemical reactions most of the day, you know, like a 12 hour day working in the lab. And when, when you've done 12 hours in the lab, you need something to decompress before you can go to bed. So what this guy and I would do is we'd go out to the local bar and there was a foosball table and he and I became foosball partners and we would just play foosball for an hour or two and then we'd go home and go to bed. So uh, that developed a, a really great way of decompressing as well. And it all came from this study group. So. <clears throat> All right, anyone else want to uh, bring something up that uh, maybe we didn't cover in any of yeah. the other panels? Yeah, I do want to bring something up. It's not, a, it's not a specific theme per se, but I think maybe a strategy. Um, I think maybe the strategy, or it could be a theme, I guess, um, analysis paralysis or dealing with analysis paralysis. So now that you've gone through all these different panels, you have all these, all these different strategies, of how to do all these different things. Um, one of the issues that I have personally is, oh, there's so many things to do. I, I'm, I, end, up, I end up doing nothing because I'm in analysis paralysis mode uh, because there's almost too many things to do. Um, so as I mentioned before uh, about the community to support finding one person, um, in, in the case of all of these different recommendations and strategies that you're getting from all these different panelists, it's really just choosing one thing and doing that and not being afraid to make a mistake and, and, and you know, failing at something. Because I think in grad school, although, you know, some things are more important than others not to fail, you do learn through that process of trying things and not doing things well. Um, and those are kind of the skills that you'll use after you leave school in whatever career that you're going to be going into. So, um, dealing with analysis paralysis and kind of taking the first steps in, um, in being successful, I think is something that people don't think about too much, right? You get thrown a lot of strategies, but you don't really, um, really know how to get started. So if, you know, if we can uh, figure, out, figure out ways to just get started, and my, my recommendation is just, just do something. <laughs> something about the problem is just do something and see if it works. Um, I think that to me, that's better than thinking about it too much and not getting anything done. So that's what my recommendation would be in the sense of thinking about not overthinking things, essentially. Great, wonderful advice. Thank you, John. Any other uh, panelists comments? 
Uh, I will just add a little bit uh, onto what Johnny and Mark, both of you have shared about the importance of health and well-being. Um, so based on my own experience, starting from undergrad, or maybe starting from high school and undergrad and graduate school and postdoc, et cetera, the more we are going, quote unquote, up, the more unstructured life would be. So if you're thinking about undergrad study, we you still we still sort of have the classes to take, and then at certain time you go to class, and certain time you go back, etc. It's kind of still semi-structured. But when you go to graduate, especially PhD, a lot of the time it's very open-ended and unstructured. You will need to manage all different kinds of uh, your studies and your research and writing paper, et cetera. And sometimes life can get really unstable in terms of managing all kinds of things, not to mention if, if you have caring responsibilities, et cetera. So, and that's the more structured, unstructured your life is, the more likely we'll face stress. And when stress is coming, and then at least for me, I feel my diet, my digestion is just a, disrupted and my sleep and my emotional health, everything, including my focus on my work. And for me, that was a bad example. The more stressed I, I was, the, more light, the less likely I'm able to focus. And the less likely I'm going to um, I can focus, I will push myself to work harder. Now we really went, to, went into a bad cycle. Um, so I have to say in my in my graduate studies, I had a lot of stress, but I didn't ask for any help. And I don't, I don't think, I never think that's a healthy way for me. And right now, in a retrospective, if, for example, I can have better stress co coping mechanism, if I can get eight hours of sleep every night, I know graduate school is really, is really stressful. And if I can just eat a little bit more healthier, I think I'll be much more productive and more balanced during my graduate studies. And uh, another thing is, um, I didn't do that well in my graduate school, but in my postdoc, some of, I hang out with the graduate students and they told me, um, it's sort of like um, recommended practice. Whenever you feel stressed, go to see, uh, there are always counseling services on campus. And I used to think that a kind of taboo and don't want to touch upon that, et cetera. But in the lab I was doing in my postdoc, they kind of create this environment. Would never feel stressful, go and talk to so-and-so in for um, counseling and stress support, et cetera. Just want everyone to know that it is a kind of active and proactive support. It's never a taboo. It's just part of your health. Like you're getting, if you get cold, then you take some um, practice, maybe take some math, et cetera, and then you feel better. The same with stress and mental, emotional well-being. I hope everyone can just really take good care of yourself whenever there's stress that you might predict. Yeah, thank you, you. That's such, such an important point about <clears throat> maintaining wellness across the spectrum, but especially reducing stress. And grad school induces lots of stress, no doubt about that. <laughs> Any just other? To say, Go ahead, just to say, you know, Just to say that, um, I know Nathan mentioned like head, heart, and hand, but health is actually the fourth H. For those that are familiar with 4H across the US, there's, there's actually the four H's, heart, uh, head, heart, um, hand, and health. So you guys talking about health as that kind of fourth pillar is actually, you know, it's actually part of this youth program that is uh, around us. So maybe some of you actually have participated in that, but if you haven't, it's actually very good. Um, kind of um, uh, way to think about um, a life, right? About with using these four H's. So just wanted to throw that in there because I know that um, Nathan kind of brought up three H's earlier and I say, oh, there's a fourth H, health. Great, thank you, John. Any other comments from the panelists <clears throat> about subjects that maybe didn't come up in any of the other panels? Do any of the students want to chime in on topics that maybe didn't come up in other panels that you think uh, we should talk about with regard to success in grad school? Okay, well, <clears throat> let's go ahead and pivot to the next part of our, of our panel, which is questions from the mentees. And we're remarkably just about right on time. So <laughs> I don't know how that worked out, but it's just about right. 
So at this point, if the mentees have any questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can uh, unmute and ask them. Um, anybody have a question that they would like the panel to discuss? Or a comment? Sophia, please. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Yeah, I think, and then you've gotten remuted, so I'm not sure if you're having a technical difficulty, Sophia. Try unmuting again, please. Ah, technical difficulties. <clears throat> so while we wait uh, for Sophia to work on her technical difficulty, I see something from Kay. Are all the panelists who've participated in AMAS part of the SJSU family? Uh, yes, all are faculty members. The concept behind the AMAS panels, and in fact, behind the AMAS mentors, was that they should be not just faculty members, but faculty members who are relatively new to SJSU. And the, the, the conceit, the idea was that by doing that, they're relatively close in many cases to the experiences that grad students are going through. They maybe have recently been in a graduate program, or at least they're going through the change of starting up in a new place at SJSU. So uh, that was really the concept behind developing, uh, behind selecting the mentors for this program. So virtually all of, of the mentors are, uh, I think, what we call junior faculty, which means that they are not yet tenured assistant yeah. professors. Sophia, did you have any? Oh, uh, we'll go to Juliana and then we'll see if, uh, if Sophia can get back on. Juliana? Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for presenting today. Um, for me, as a graduate student, I find that I have been putting a lot of my energy, maybe it's one of my coping mechanisms, into building that community and establishing those relationships. But sometimes I find myself feeling guilty because some of my peers are like, nope, sorry, I can't. I have this to study for. I have that to study for. And I'm like, but I want to feel balanced. Has anybody ever been in that situation where your peers or you're trying to connect with are like not available, but as you want to sort of let off some steam or have a moment, um, like how do you navigate that? Yeah, great question. Any of the panelists want to take that? Yeah, for, I will just say for sure. I mean, that was absolutely my experience. One of the things I found most difficult about uh, the program is that just, you know, where I was in my life is not where other people were in, in their lives. And so it just didn't match up, right? And so I think that's why it's important to have multiple groups and not to stop looking uh, for the right group for you. Uh, and it really, it, it took me a while. Um, and I tried many, many different things and some of those things didn't work out so well. Um, you just got to keep going and keep looking for new groups and you will find people that that make you feel validated. And I mean, you know, actually, one thing I found is that there was a lot of times I really didn't want to talk to other graduate students, you know, because I wanted to get out of that headspace and into a different place altogether. So yeah, I think that's normal to to have that happen. And just to add that people have different timing. So some people they may be busy currently may not be later so having a large like building a larger community allows you to kind of float around to different groups based on their whoever's current situation is is not as busy with other things so i think part of it is kind of if, if you can expand your group larger it's it's helpful for you to not have to rely on just a small small group of people and I also want to add on top of that, sometimes we want to connect with people because there's underlying needs there. And the need might be, I just want some, somebody to talk about, to talk about something. Maybe it's something like, I want to find accountability, accountability buddy, buddy so that we can work on our studies. And sometimes might be, uh, I just want to chill out, something like that. So basically, I think once that you identify your needs, we're less likely to tie socializing with a person or a special group, but more of who 
this is my need and what might be different strategies and what might be different kind of people who can meet my needs in this particular way so that and we, are, we might feel more detached about the certain person that we want to hang out with. And uh, on the other side, uh, well, Juliana, you didn't mention that, but sometimes maybe we want to protect your own energy as well. Sometimes um, maybe people will ask you, and when just in case you are unavailable or you may want to spend more time taking care of yourself, uh, I always tell my students, it's perfectly fine to say no. So it's just like both ways I want to point out here. So I see in the chat, um, <clears throat> Kay has suggested a virtual study group, which I think is a great idea. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, sometimes having mutual non-academic interests as the focal point is a good way. So for example, I, you know, I'm just gonna make up some, something up, but let's say you like hiking, right? There might be a group on campus that just goes hiking once every couple of weeks, and you could just pop into that. And you might find that if, that if you share a passion for hiking, that, you know, that someone there will end up being sort of a natural person to hang out with when you're going hiking. And the same thing might be for completely other things. Maybe it's a basketball game, or maybe it's, uh, you know, it could be it could be anything, but some kind of alternative non-academic activity that just interests you. Might, you might find other people who have similar interests. And so it's not necessarily finding one of your cohort grad students and saying, hey, you, let's go out and do this thing. It might be more just finding other people who like to do the, the general activity and then getting together that way. And that can actually be especially good because often as someone else was saying, they're different people, maybe they're not facing the same challenges that you're facing and it's a completely refreshing experience, so. All right, any other uh, re uh, reactions to Juliana's uh, question or any other comments or questions? I think there was a question earlier that was missed. So I think Stephanie asked how hard or easy was it to find a job after grad school was her question. Ah, um, great question. I don't have a quick answer to that. So if somebody has a answer, please chime in. It's probably gonna be- I'll just say from my own experience, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> um, it took a lot of work, let's put it that way but it happened. Um, it's definitely, I'd say for my personality, it's not the thing I enjoy doing most, but I've done it three times now. Um, uh, and so just don't get discouraged by that. That's what I would have to say is that, you know, it's just like anything, you know, you're gonna put out a lot of uh, applications and get few responses and that's just normal. Um, I don't know, maybe we should, that is something maybe there could be a panel discussion in a future uh, topic was just to talk about the whole job market. It's probably quite different uh, in different places, but my experience was initially, you know, you throw your applications out there, um, they pick three, they go with those three. If they have to go to the fourth, they'll go to the fourth kind of thing. Might be different in different departments, but nowadays um, they're doing all these uh, pre-campus uh, visit uh, Zoom calls. This is what they're doing now. And I think that might end up being permanent. Um, and so I think they're actually going for a larger group than just the three traditionally they would go for. Uh, and then they're narrowing it down after the Zoom call to three campus visits or something like that. Anyways, it's it's hard, of course, but you know, it's just a process like anything else. And it's definitely not something you want to get discouraged by because um, it's a numbers game. And you know, the reason why you don't get selected for a particular job or for a particular interview are now that you see it from the other side, <laughs> you realize definitely the candidate shouldn't feel bad about themselves because um, that's very unlikely to be the reason why they're not getting the invite. Um, you know, it's a very idiosyncratic process. Let's put it that way. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Carlos, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on just the whole job hunting uh, expedition, I guess. Uh, I went for industry and faculty jobs um, when I was doing my search. Um, I think um, one thing that uh, a um, counselor that I had gave me a good advice, it's, uh, you know, don't look at it whether you got the job and or if you didn't get the job, if that's like your metric for success. It's mostly if you were happy with the preparation you did uh, for the interview. Um, and yeah, it's like Nathan just mentioned, it's a numbers game. So you just have to apply to as many uh, opportunities as you have. And yeah, eventually uh, something, you'll find something. 
and and yeah. uh and and I hope this doesn't sound cheesy, y'all, but I, I think I really had to hold on to some of these kind of affirmations in the process because being on the job market's rough, you know, you you put in your time, you go through your doctoral program, and it's very much like a, a hit and miss process. You know, I would encourage that your role is to put as many applications and putting the materials together to put yourself in in that position to be considered. And that is a heavy lift in itself to get the materials looked at and tightened and you know crafted for uh, for that position. But I would say in particular with my journey and looking at a few of my colleagues now as, as a lot of us wrapped up in 2018, 19, um, is that sometimes you might have to see a bit of the rejection or not that door opening as a redirection. Because there were so many moments like on my journey where I had no idea that the postdoc opportunity was gonna take me out to the Denver area that being there for three and a half years was then gonna, you know, and getting, not getting considered for a series of positions and then put it back to where I had an opportunity to come back to California, be only six hours away from friends and family and community and actually be in an ethnic studies department, Chicano Chicano studies in particular, doing this amazing, doing this amazing work here. So I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's definitely something I would echo, like, you know, uh, uh, like Dita was saying, it needs its own workshop. I get cautious with it too, because it's, it's, it, it's, uh, I don't want folks to get discouraged as they go through the process, but again, knowledge is power. I think the more preparation and the more we can talk about it now, as you go in, then you can start preparing strategies to begin to, to address it. But um, I think it's really being open to uh, the idea that it is gonna be a process. So how can you maybe get some lecturing in? How can you continue with your writing? And probably how can you stay connected to your dissertation committee? your advisors and that committee, if you build it well, there will be your letters of recommenders on the job market. They'll help keep you connected as well. And I just see that in the chat that uh, Melissa Kay wanted to point out occupational therapy, there are jobs out there. So I think she's putting in a plug for her field. So thank you, Melissa. Um, any other reactions to the, the job question? Yeah, just to kind of quickly add to what Johnny said at the end about letters of recommendation, this is the time as a grad student to make those connections, right? Even if they're part of your committee as in grad school, your for your thesis, uh, but other faculty, other individuals, um, you know, have conversations with people. This is part of that community um, that you're building, right? They're also going to be supporting you when you're looking for jobs as well. So making those building those relationships now while you're in school so that they can have authentic letters and recommendations when they when they provide them is going to be important because um, people that are evaluating those letters can really see if they had a relationship or not with you. So it's important that you build those now. Yeah, Thanks. and also just want to add a little bit about connection. Um, when you present your work in conferences or professional uh, occasions, those are very important. I remember how I met my postdoc advisor was um, after a talk and I would just feel naturally very interested in the topic. So I had a long conversation after the conference with her. And then later I got a scholarship to do my postdoc in a um, different university. So I reach out to her and say, I'm so-and-so and, -so, and um, can I do my postdoc with my funding with you? And she just uh, immediately accepted and that's partly because of the connection we already had, even though it's very brief, it's just maybe 15 minutes at the conference, but that's, um, and I just feel that kind of conversation is very important as part of the networking process. Um, and uh, also I really want to echo everyone has shared about um, being okay with rejection. Uh, for my current faculty job, I was on the job market for two years, and uh, the first year I didn't get anything, and I feel really, really bad about that, and it's not so, uh, and I feel really sad, actually, and now, in the retrospective, I just feel much more fortunate that was um, the second year, because that would be much more well prepared, and in a, a current position, really, I, I really love, so even if you maybe one year later, it doesn't mean that's the bad thing from a long-term perspective, if you're able to find the in institution that you really, really love, I think that's most rewarding instead of just getting the job, so yeah, a little bit I want to share about. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to add something about the letters of recommendation. So <clears throat> I'm going to speak now about a faculty position because that's really the only thing that I really know about from personal experience. But <clears throat> getting a faculty job, the letters of recommendation are really important to get you the interview. 
So uh, if the letters of recommendation are strong and people can say that you have potential, that will help you to get that interview. But once you have the interview, the letters of recommendation don't matter. It's how you do in the interview. And as several people have said, it's, it's a learning process. It takes time. I've ha I had some horrific interviews. My, my very first faculty interview, I will not mention the university, but I went to interview to become a professor at a university. I flew in there. I spent the night, you know, I flew in the night before. I spent the night in a hotel. I was so nervous, I did not sleep a wink. I literally did not sleep. I got up the next morning, well, got up, you know. <laughs> I got dressed the next morning after tumbling and turning all night. And I went to the university and I was so tired that I basically couldn't communicate with people in any effective way. It was just, it was just a complete disaster. I mean, you know, it, I got through it, it was okay. But I felt so bad and it was because I didn't sleep. It, you know, I couldn't even, what, whatever talents I had, I could not demonstrate. <laughs> so um, the next time I did an interview, I actually was able to sleep. And after that, it went better. I still didn't get the job, but it went better. Then the next interview, you know, I still didn't get the job, but it went better. And over time, you sort of refine it. You figure out what people are going to ask. You kind of get the hang of it. You get used to it. You get better at it. And then ultimately, I ended up getting a job. I only had one job offer the year that I got hired. And luckily, it was a place that I was comfortable with. And I took the job. And it was great. So uh, I think this has been said in many ways before. But rejection is not failure. Right? If you're not hired for a job, that's not a failure. It just means it wasn't a good connection or something went wrong, like you didn't sleep or whatever. It doesn't matter. There, there, there is going to be a place where you land that's going to be a good fit. I see there's another question in the chat from Juliana. Uh, and it, she says it's controversial. How much impact does your GPA have on your success after you graduate? Oh, that's an interesting question. Anyone want to handle that? I, I can only say this. Um, my GPA helped me to get a scholarship uh, to get into a PhD program. Um, and I think that's the last time I ever looked at GPA. So uh, in the PhD program, I don't think it meant anything. I don't think I ever reported it to anyone. And uh, there might have been, I guess, uh, as part of the hiring process, they asked to see your transcript to prove that you actually have the degree that you claim to have. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know. I don't know where GPA matters um, after a master's degree. Um, yeah, I, I had this conversation with um, some folks in industry uh, last summer um, where we asked them like, how important is GPA when you're doing your hiring? And it's kind of like, well, you know, there's like a minimum that you need, but after that, it's more of what interesting things that you do while you were in school kind of thing. Um, you know, did you do well in the interviews or whatever questions they ask you? And after that, yeah, especially after you get your first job, like no one ever asks you again, what's your, what was your GPA? Um, yeah, it's usually just that first initial, especially, you know, getting through the screeners of uh, your resume and getting that first interview. And after that, yeah you don't see it or hear about it. Yeah, I would say the GPA could be a factor in getting that interview. But once you're at the interview, nobody cares what the GPA is. It's all about how you do in the interview, I would say. Yes, yeah, especially even in uh, once you're in graduate school, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't become as much of a factor. So, More so, so when I was in, got my bachelor's, yeah. So maybe maybe people that are pursuing a PhD after the master's, maybe that could be a potential situation where it could play. So I, that's the only place I can think if it matters in your stage as a master's student, if you're thinking about a PhD program. Yeah, I think that's accurate, John, but I think that um, it depends on the, on the subject and it depends on the university. But I would say that the GPA is not as big of a, of a screening factor in getting into a doctoral program as a lot of other considerations. Uh, at least in my experience. And I used to be at a former university, I was actually on the admissions committee for doctoral students. And so I, I reviewed a whole lot of applications. And you know, the GPA is one indicator of something, but by and large, other things tend to uh, be more important. Like if the person has research experience, yeah. if they have strong letters of recommendation, if there's evidence that they have good um, you know, perseverance and grit, 
these are really important factors for success in, in PhD programs. And so, uh, yeah, GPA is a factor, but I wouldn't say it's the central factor. Johnny, did you, uh, you wrote Emmy's question. Did you wanna? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I actually, because I'm still new here, I'm wondering like how much does our college and career center or do, do we have the resources at San Jose State to prepare um, um, our graduate students for that for that next step of a faculty interview? The, the training that I got uh, in preparation for the faculty interview was more from um, kind of like my advisor and advisees that were ahead of me that were already on the job market and that were in positions. Um, they had like this working Google draft that had some kind of anticipated questions that sent that seemed to circulate around like you know one of the biggest ones was like, why are you a good fit for this program, not just academically but for the university community as a whole right like you start to kind of see some of these common themes and. And I, I do remember you know developing some short answers printing out these questions decoding the um, the uh, the job call right and, and like breaking stuff and how your research and how your pedagogy mentoring and teaching fit in to those spots. But I don't know if there's a formalized uh, uh, program to do it, but I do think that uh, I, I'm definitely was a benefit of actually having folks uh, in my community when I was able to reach out to do two mock presentations. So I did a mock um, research presentation that they ask you to do when you become a finalist. And then I did a teaching demo with the students that I was teaching currently in my postdoc and then some other former mentees of mine just to for flow, it was more of just for me. I, I feel like if I had a chance to kind of bump through it and do one good rough draft, that when it came time to actually deliver would be there. But but if it if SJSU doesn't have it, then I, I would encourage us to really think about like all the the heavy the, the preparation and heavy lift that comes with with when you finally get the interview. Because it's huge. You've got you've got a big shot, you know, to finally get to that point. And one more thing is, uh, I, I was advised and do that all the time is asking for people who are ahead of you already got a job market asking for, can you share your uh, application material with me? And I asked a bunch of them and so far, none of my friends and colleagues has ever rejected sharing their material with me and also their experience. So go and ask. Uh, especially if they're in, in the same field. Uh, well, just help you a lot. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you. I see we're approaching the end of our time. We've got about four minutes left. So uh, are there any last pressing questions that anyone would like to ask? Or does anyone want to um, say something that was an important takeaway from the AMAS program overall? Um, hi, this is Rosa. I think it's a really good program. Um, I think there's a lot of good things that come out of it. Um, I'm, it seems like it's a work in progress, just like we are. So I think, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, you're exactly right, Rosa. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, and thank you for the, for the nice uh, words. It is a work in progress. This is the first time we've done it. And we're considering what we want to do for next year. And so, you know, feedback is really important. There's not going to be time today for everyone to have their feedback, obviously, but we will be reaching out to you. Uh, I think Amy Lysenring will be reaching out to you to ask for your uh, evaluation of how things have gone. And this will go both to the mentors and to the mentees. And I know, you know, everybody's got survey fatigue and, you know, it's easier to just hit delete than it is to answer. But you can pay forward whatever benefit you gain from this program by giving us honest and helpful feedback about the program so that we can uh, take that into consideration as we develop what we're gonna do next. So um, maybe with that, I will just thank our panelists for uh, being a fantastic panel today. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful. Really appreciate all of your comments and insights. And also I wanna thank all of our mentees for coming. And I wanna just say thank you all for participating in the AMAS program. It was a little experimental as, as we've noted and you all took a chance and I hope that there was value. Uh, I know that for, for me, there was value in the things I participated in and I hope that there was value for all of you. So with that, 
I say thank you, happy Friday, and enjoy the, your weekend. Take care, everybody.